Um, y'all ready for Thanksgiving? Yeah, good. Me too. Um, kids are out of school. It's going to be a good week. Um, all right, we're going to jump in. Uh, the, uh, we're going to be uh, this morning in uh, Genesis. Uh, yeah, we'll be in Genesis, I'll tell you, in about 25, chapter 25 um, later. Um, but I'll tell you a little story. So this week, um, I was driving down the road with Piper, my daughter, who's six years old. And we were on our way to um, somewhere, I can't remember where, but it was just me and Piper, and we were headed um, to out with each other. And um, she starts talking to me, and she starts uh, saying this, um, kind of talking, because Piper likes to talk. Um, she talks, she talks enough. And so she uh, likes to talk. And so she was driving down, and she starts to um, say, this poem that you've, we've all heard before of uh, the, like, wishing, wishing upon a star, you know? Like, I wish I may, I wish I might. Um, how, do you, how does it go? Y'all tell me. I wish I may, I wish I might. Have the wish I wish tonight, whatever. And then you tell the wish, right? And then you can't, but then you can't share the wish with anybody. And so she starts doing this, right? She starts doing this uh, wish thing. And then I said, Piper, what did you wish for? She goes, oh, I can't tell you. And I said, well, yeah, you can. I'm your dad. You can tell me anything. She goes, no, dad, if I tell you the wish, it won't come true. And I said, well, no, you can tell me, though. That doesn't, that doesn't apply to it. And so we get in this, like, if you're trying to, like, reason with a six-year-old, you know? And so I, I was, like, doing all my, I mean, I'm in sales, too, right? Like, I know how to negotiate this stuff, you know? Like, I, I can do it. And so uh, finally, like, we were going back and forth. She's like, I can't tell you. I can't tell you because I want it to come true, and it's not going to come true if I tell you what I wished for. And so I said, well, I'm going to make a wish too, and I'm not going to tell you what I wish for then. <laughs> a little manipulation there, isn't that good? And so, I, and, and, she, and she was like, fine. And then it got to her. She was like, okay, Dad, what did you wish for? And I said, I'll only tell you if you tell me. And so I told her, I, I know, I'm a, I'm a six-year-old as well. And so I, I, the maturity level is like the same level. And so I, I, and so I told her what my wish was, which I'm not going to tell you guys because it's not going to come true if I do. And so, I, and so I, I told her what I wished for, and then I said, so Piper, what did you wish for? And she goes, I wished for a bunny. And I said, oh, yeah, you are right. That's not going to come true because you told me. <laughs> You, you told me, so it's not going to come true. And she did not like that at all. Um, but I never told her anything different. So uh, we're not going to get a bunny. Um, and so I, I, I was thinking about that because I feel like that's, that's kind of a lot of people's um, relationship with God is like, you know. I can turn anything to a sermon, by the way. But I, I, it's kind of like how, how people interact with God. It's, it's like they kind of treat God as, as like he's a genie in the sky, you know, making wishes that he is supposed to um, grant to us an unlimited amount of time. So I, I think for a lot of people, our prayer life becomes a lot like that, kind of this transactional kind of relationship where God, I'll do, or, or we start to bargain of like, God, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. You know, and, and God, I promise I'll never mess up ever again if you come through and you do this, uh, this one time. Or, or, or we kind of get, like, superstitious about it. Like, like, with the wish, like, if I tell you, then it won't come true. And it's like this superstitious kind of attitude. And, and we kind of treat God like that sometimes, I think. If, uh, it's like, if, if God, if I do these certain things, then you'll bless me. If I, as long as I please you in these areas, then you'll uh, be happy with me. And a lot of people, that's, that's their relationship with God. That's what it kind of looks like. Like God's always constantly disappointed, and they're always trying to earn his approval, and, 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 and never, try, never quite measuring up to that. And I was thinking about this, and I, and I was thinking about, like, why is that? Like, why do, why do we, so many of us kind of wrestle with that, or, or feel that kind of way, or, or even approach God in that Way and I, and I think part of it is just in the mindset and the mentality that so much of us, many of us, grew up with, especially here in America, is that we're really good at like earning things and really bad at just receiving things. Any of y'all are just really bad at receiving gifts? You get Christmas coming up. Yeah, Stephanie's terrible at receiving gifts. If you give if you give Stephanie a gift, don't expect any kind of reaction whatsoever. She'll just be like, "Thanks." 
and then just walk away. Not that she didn't appreciate it, like she loved it. She just doesn't, she knows, I've, told, I've said that before, right? And, and receiving gifts, or maybe like receiving compliments. Like I'm not very good at receiving compliments, I'll be honest with you. I, I normally make some kind of awkward joke or something to diffuse the situation because it makes me feel all weird. Or, or, or like receiving uh, recognition. Some people, like if you were to like even say their name in a public setting like this, you would just like slouch in your chair and hide because you think everybody would be staring at you. I'm going to point out a few of you right now. No. Um, but that would, that would or, or like receiving feedback from people, receiving criticism from people. We get like deeply offended and, 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 and almost hurt or we get a defensive about why we did what we did and because we don't like receiving. We don't like receiving input sometimes. We don't like receiving even advice sometimes. We're just stubborn, set in our ways of doing what we want to do. Or sometimes people aren't good at receiving love. It doesn't feel genuine. They don't feel very lovable. And so it's hard for them to even receive love from somebody else. Or receiving forgiveness. They feel just so, they're just ridden with guilt and condemnation that they can't even receive the, the forgiveness that somebody tries to bestow on them or even, receive, or, or even forgive themselves for mistakes they've made. Or, gosh, receiving grace. Grace. And because we, we get in this earning thing, right? And grace is a gift. We can't earn the grace of God. But we try. Receiving mercy. And then we punish ourselves, you know? Somebody's merciful towards us, and then we just punish ourselves for, for the thing that, that happened. I, in fact, I think, I was thinking about this, and I think like two of the only things that a lot of us may be good at is punishment and condemnation. Like we're great at receiving our own punishment and our own condemnation for mistakes and things that we've made, but we're not very good at receiving much else. And... I think the reason I was thinking about all of this is because it's really hard to be grateful for what it is that we have when we feel like we haven't actually received anything. When we feel like everything that we have, we earned. Or everything that we have was owed to us to begin with. Or everything that we have, we deserve it. Almost like this entitlement kind of attitude with it. And so when it comes to receiving, when you're talking about really just receiving something unconditionally from somebody else, especially something as powerful as the love of God, sometimes I think it's hard for people to really grasp what that means because we can't fully wrap our heads around the fact that God just loves us without us doing anything to earn it or without us even deserving it. So in Genesis chapter 25, we meet this guy named um, Jacob. Jacob, I think, struggled with this very idea, that God was trying to pour um, blessing and use Jacob in all of these amazing ways, but Jacob just had a hard time receiving it. So in, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22, give you some context. Um, Jacob's parents are Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebekah becomes pregnant with twins, Jacob and Esau. And in Genesis 25, verse 22, uh, God prophesies to Rebekah and says this, but the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? So she's pregnant with twins. They're wrestling around, making Rebecca miserable. She asked, the, asked, and the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And so uh, before they were even born, God tells Rebecca. The younger son is going to serve the older son. And then we get to see this all kind of play out through Jacob and Esau's life. But what Jacob does is he kind of takes what, what God intended for him all along, and he takes, it into, he takes it into his own hands. 
He, he decides to make happen what God intended to make happen already. He, he doesn't believe that he can simply receive God's plan and purpose for his life without him having to do it himself. And so what he does is as they grow um, and they get a little older, Jacob and Esau um, have this run in. Esau was out hunting. He is starving. He comes back in. Jacob is good in the kitchen. He likes to cook. And Esau is so hungry that he looks at Jacob and he says, I, uh, and make me a bowl of soup. Jacob says, the only way I'm going to make you a bowl of soup, starts bargaining, the only way I'm going to make you a bar- bowl of soup is if you sell me your birthright. And Esau looks at him, and you know the story. What good is a birthright if I'm dead? You can have it. And he sells his birthright for a bowl of soup. Now, the birthright um, is, uh, is interesting. It's kind of like being the trustee over an estate. If, if, if that's ever happened. So the, the firstborn son would receive a double portion of the father's wealth in, a, in estate because the first firstborn son, it was their responsibility to carry on the family lineage to the next generations. And so they would have the responsibility of taking care of all their siblings and all, even their relatives. And, you know, if there was a widow or there was an orphan that was, ended up happening within the family, it was the firstborn's responsibility as the birthright bearer to take care of everybody else. And because of that, they received a double portion of the inheritance from their father to help them in doing so. So this is the very thing that Esau gives away. In other words, Esau doesn't want that kind of responsibility. It doesn't mean anything to him. Later on in the Bible, it says that Esau despised his birthright, which means I think that Esau just didn't want to have to deal with with the responsibility of all of that. Instead, what Esau is after is his father's blessing. What happens is, This birthright thing happens, and then you fast forward until Isaac is on his deathbed. Jacob decides that he's going to trick his father. He's going to manipulate in order to get what God had intended for him all along. He's going to manipulate the way in which it's going to happen. And so Rebecca and Jacob, they kind of conspire together. He puts on the long sleeves, and he pretends to be Esau, and he goes in to Esau's room, and he receives the father's blessing onto his life. Now, the blessing is a little bit different than the birthright. The blessing is really about favor that's just given from God. It's, it's about having just the wealth, the material possessions, but even beyond that, health, success, protection, divine protection, Like all of these things come along with the blessing and this is what Esau has his eye on. This is the thing that matters to him because this makes Esau great. The blessing is what Esau is after. And Esau is furious at this point when he finds out that that Jacob tricked him. And so Jacob has to run away. He goes to his uncle Laban's house. Um, There he sees some uh, uh, Rachel, Laban's daughter, who is like super beautiful. And so he falls in love with Rachel. He says, Laban, I'm going to work for you for seven years. And in doing so, give me your daughter, Rachel. And so uh, Jacob works for seven years and he has that wedding day. They, the bride walks down the aisle and boom, Jacob finds out that it's not Rachel, but it's Leah, Laban's older daughter. Oops. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and, and so Jacob isn't very happy because now he's the one that gets tricked. And so he goes to Laban and he says, Laban, you tricked me. You gave me Leah. I wanted Rachel. And then he makes a deal with Laban now. I'm going to work another seven years in exchange for Rachel. So that's what Laban and Jacob agree to. And so now Jacob is married to both Rachel and Leah, both of Laban's daughters, and he starts working for Laban. And through working for Laban over these 14 years, Jacob starts to accumulate his own wealth, his own stuff. He he makes a deal with Laban at one point that he can get certain speckled animals from his flock, and it just so happens because of the blessing that's on his life that all the goats and sheep and livestock to be born just happen to be speckled. And so, so Jacob ends up actually getting all of Laban's 
wealth, and then they have a falling out, and so Jacob now has to leave again. And it's on his way back home that Jacob gets really, really scared. Look at Genesis chapter 32. Because now that that Jacob is going back home, he knows that he's going to run into none other than his brother Esau. And they have not seen each other at this point in over a decade. So this is what uh, Genesis 32 verse 9 tells us. Jacob is on his way to see Esau, and he turns to God. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me, return to, your, return to your own land and to your relatives. And you promised me I will treat you kindly. I am not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. O oh Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother, Esau. I am afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promised me I will surely treat you kindly, and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sand along the seashore, too many to count. So Jacob, in his fear, and anxiety of what he uh, thinks could happen in his reunion with his brother, he turns to God. And he says, God, I'm, thank you for all the blessings that you've given me so far. Thank you for, for everything that you've done. I have two camps now. I've went, I came from nothing into now having to divide up everything that I have because I have so much. And, and, and he prays and he asks God to rescue him out of Esau's hand. Jacob also decides to hedge his bets. And so he takes takes part of his wealth, part of his estate, and he starts to divide it up as gifts to his brother Esau because he wants to get on Esau's good side. He thinks that he can bribe him, and then Esau, even if he is mad, he's like, hey, at least he hooked me up with a bunch of goats and camels. And so literally Jacob gives gives hundreds of camels, hundreds of goats, of sheep, of sheep, because I'm good at grammar, y'all, uh, of sheep, of rams, ewes, bulls, donkeys. I mean, he just unloads everything for his brother. He sends his family away out of protection for them because he's terrified of what his brother might do. He's ready to hold out all the stops just to save his own life. And now here's the point that I want to uh, mention. Jacob's desires for his life, what Jacob wants for Jacob's life, and God's desires for Jacob's life are the same. They each want the same thing. Jacob wants his life to, to, to outnumber his life to mean something, that his descendants to outnumber the stars and to, 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 to see his life uh, be, and the promises of God on his life be fulfilled in his life and through his life. God wants that exact same thing. But where they differ, where they disagree, is how to get there. What they they can't get to uh, terms with is, is that Jacob is always trying to make happen what God has already promised. How often do we do the same thing? I think that there's three real areas that we have a hard time just trusting God with. The first one being timing. We try to speed up what God wants us to wait patiently for. And so we we try to make it happen before God maybe wants it to happen. Or we have a hard time trusting God's will or desire for our lives. Like we, we wonder, like, does God even want it to happen? Does he want this for me? I want it for me, but does God want it for me? We find it hard to trust him there. We have a hard time trusting the method. We can't see how it would happen. How will this be accomplished? And so we take it into our own hands of like, God, let me show you how you're going to do this. I'm going to 
date this person, and then we're going to get married, and then we're going to fall in love in that order for some reason. And, and, and so, and then we're going to build this amazing life together, and it's all going to be beautiful and wonderful and perfect. And God's like, he never asked me. Anyway. We have these, these plans and these things, and it can be so hard to trust God. And we fall into, I think, the same trap that Jacob fell into is when we end up kind of taking these things by the horns in our own hands, um, we, we end up doing so no matter what it costs. We end up doing so no matter what it means for our character, for the kind of person that we are, no matter what it takes. And so for Jacob, he wanted God's plan for his life. He wanted to fulfill the purposes that God had for him. And he decided to do so through deceit and manipulation and lying and rushing and force and control. He had a hard time resting and trusting and surrendering. And the thing that we see in Jacob's life is that by doing so, he actually makes life so much harder on himself. And I think that we do the same. For Jacob, because of the way he went about things, he was constantly on the run, constantly trying to cover his tracks, constantly anxious and afraid of getting caught, constantly lying and deceiving to try to get ahead or to try to make up for the last, last lie and deception that he had told before. All because he didn't trust. Because he didn't surrender. Because he couldn't quite get there. And I think we do the same, right? Like we can't imagine that God would just care so much for us and want to bless us just because he loves us, just because we're his children, just because he cares and he, his eyes on the sparrow and he's watching over you and me. We have a really hard time with that. Jacob spends this night sends off all of his family, sends off all of his people, and it's just him, alone in this field, under the stars. You can imagine it's just silent. Jacob lays his head down to go to sleep. And this is what happens. Genesis 32, verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win, this, win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of his sock, socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel. Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob has this interesting night. He wrestles all night long with God. You ever done that? wrestled through the night with something on your mind, something you can't let go of, something that's wearing on you, something that you can't figure out how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen or if God wants it to happen. Stay up all night racking your brain trying to problem solve and trying to figure it out. I have way too many times. See, Jacob, through this night, was wrestling all night long, and he refused to let go. Him and this man, him and, him and, him and this man are, are, are all over each other, fighting it out all throughout the night. Jacob is, is so stuck, he's so stubborn, he's so committed to winning this fight, to doing it his way, that he refuses to let go. The man strikes his hip, it says, and, and dislocates his very hip. We, we end up hurting ourselves when we don't let go, don't we? We end up, we end up hurting ourselves when, when in those situations that we just try to go our own way. 
But Jacob refused to let go without a blessing. He says, I'm not letting go until you bless me. But what's interesting is I think that it just simply reinforces the very point that I'm trying to make. Jacob had already received God's blessing. His father had already blessed him. He was already blessed by God. He was already walking in God's favor. God had already provided for him. God had already protected him. God had already made a way in his life. Jacob already had God's blessing. He already had God's favor. He didn't need Esau's. He didn't need that. He didn't need to wrestle all night long in order to receive God's blessing on his life, in order for God to meet the need in his life. He already had it. He just couldn't receive it. He just couldn't believe it for himself. He didn't trust that that was actually true. I think maybe he just would never allow himself to just truly receive what was already his. And I think a lot of us do the same. Maybe you've never really allowed yourself to just truly receive what God has already promised you. Maybe you've never allowed yourself to just really believe that you really are loved unconditionally, by God, that he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you, and he's not mad at you. Even on the worst day of your life, he's still not mad at you. That his grace is big enough to cover a multitude of sins. And that he's with us even if we don't feel like it, even if we don't deserve it. That's how good he is. Jacob finally starts to receive this and starts to believe it, but it requires him coming to the end of himself. Getting to the point that he's able to let go of the control and the manipulation and the trying to do it his own way and the trying to make it happen and finally trusting that he actually is who God has declared him to be all along. In Hosea 12, it, it says, um, Hosea 12, verse 3, it says, Even in the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother. When he became a man, he even fought with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and won. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. There at Bethel, he met God face to face, and God spoke to him. I find it interesting that it says he, that Jacob wept when he asked for God's blessing. That he wept and pleaded with God. In other words, he, he wasn't commanding God. He was desperate. He had nowhere else to turn. He had nothing, nowhere else to do. He had finally gotten to the end of his rope and came to the end of his self. And he was finally ready to let it all go and surrender to trust that he really is who God had declared him to be and to trust what God was able to do in and through his life. And I think that he, only, that he finally came to realize that all he had left in this world was holding on to God. And I think for many of us, we have to come to that same level of desperation in our own lives, and that same level of surrender in our own lives, because it's in that place that God is able to show up in our lives, and it's in the place that when we realize that we are weak, that he is strong, that he is the one that shows up and surely does save us, because we finally realize that we can't save ourselves. This, for Jacob, it was a blessing that he couldn't earn through hard work. He couldn't deceive the man that he was wrestling with. He had nowhere else to turn and nowhere else to go. The only option he had was to let go and to trust. And it was in the letting go that blessing came. It was when he finally decided to give it all up that the man blessed him. 
And I think this, the thing is, until we decide that we're going to let go, until we decide that we are going to trust, until we decide we've done all that we can do and the only thing left is to hold on to God and his promises and his purposes for our lives, we will continue to wrestle all night long. What keeps you up at night? What do you wrestle with? For Jacob, it was something very interesting, I think. Because they get to this point, and this man, he finally looks at Jacob and he asks him a question. He says, what is your name? In verse 27, and Jacob had to tell him, I am Jacob. The name Jacob, it means deceiver, literally. Heel grabber, some of you may have heard in Sunday school. And so in other words, Jacob had to finally be honest about who he really was. He had to stop pretending. He had to stop hiding. He had to stop trying to cover it up. He had to stop trying to pretend that he was somebody that he just simply wasn't. And he had to look at God face to face and say, I'm Jacob. I'm Jacob. I'm a deceiver. I don't have it all together. I'm scared and I'm afraid and I've tried to get myself all the way to here to this place and I've come to the end of myself and I can't do this anymore. And friends, when you're in that place, the grace of God will show up with pour over you like never before. And it's in the letting go that his love shines through. God looks at him and he changes his name to Israel. Israel just simply means uh, God perseveres. That through the wrestling, through the struggling, through the, the, the stuff that Jacob prevailed when he surrendered. Blessing follows surrender. Blessing comes when we let go, not before, not while we're holding on. It wasn't until he let go that blessing came into his life. One way to say it is the blessing comes in the releasing of whatever it is that you're trying to control or make happen. It's funny, I talked to a lot of people that, and this was certainly true of me, that they find, um, they end up finding their spouse or the person that they end up, yeah, their, their spouse, when they stop looking for one. When they finally decide that I'm complete just in who I am, and when God brings somebody into my life, that's going to be an amazing day. But I'm going to trust him until then, and I'm going to fulfill the purpose and calling he has on my life until then. And when that happens, when people get to that place, it's amazing what God does. Because all of a sudden, as if by divine appointment, God brings somebody but it's in the letting go that that tends to happen. So, here's my question as we wrap it up here. What was it that you think Jacob was wrestling with the most? What was he wrestling with? Not who was he wrestling. We know he was wrestling with God. But what was he wrestling with? What was it that was holding him so much that he had struggled with his entire life, that he just couldn't quite let go of? Was it performance? He had to look this certain way. He had this, this like toxic perfectionism, you know, that he had to be the man, that he had to always perform. Was it shame? Did he just feel so shamed about what it is that he had done and deceiving his parent and father and deceiving his brother and stealing his way to the top? Was it the opinions of other people? Was he just that concerned about what Esau would have thought about him? Or others? Was it guilt and condemnation about the choices and decisions that he made? What, what was it that Jacob was wrestling with? Fear, certainly. What was the root? What was that thing that he wrestled with all night long? What is it that you wrestle with? What is it that I? Think, ask myself that. What else? So many people, you wrestle with hurt. You wrestle with anger because of what happened to you. Wrestle with unforgiveness towards somebody or even towards yourself, probably most of all. Or fear or control or 
busyness. You just wrestle with the fact of like, I can't ever stop. I can't ever slow down. I got to do, do, do more, more, more. You wrestle with this kind of uh, perfectionist attitude or pride or shame or insecurity or you name it. You wrestle with people's opinions of you or, or, or wrestle with failure or guilt or, re- or, or hiding, pretending. Wrestle with unhealthy mindsets. Wrestle with being too cynical or worrying too much or not feeling loved or not feeling lovable. You wrestle with even believing that God actually is a good God and his goodness for you and towards you. You wrestle with the very existence of God, doubting whether he's there at all. I think for Jacob and for you and for me, if you find yourself wrestling today, For Jacob, it was all about identity. His entire life is wrapped up in who it is he believes himself to be. When you think about how he stole the birthright, how he stole the blessing, it's all about identity. When he goes to Laban, he marries Rachel and Leah, being the husband, being the guy, taking Laban's wealth, bribing Esau, looking like he's the man, all comes back to identity. How do I know? Because in the wrestling, that very night, God looks at him and says, what is your name? And Jacob says, I'm a deceiver. And God looks back at him and says, no, you're not. Not anymore. Your name is Israel. And he renames him and he reshapes his very life. Jacob is never the same after this night. And in order to do that, he had to let it go. And when he lets go, God changes his very life. It says in Genesis 32, as we wrap up, bank can come up, verse 31, it says that Jacob got up that morning and he was limping from where God touched him. You know, I I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago and he we were talking about this, this story, and um, he said something really interesting. He said, you know, we all walk with a limp. We all walk with a limp. Our, our scars tell a story. I've got two scars on my, on my face. I've got one right here where I fell when I was four years old, right on metal steps. I was at a park, and I fell forward and just tapped right the edge of it and busted my nose. I know shark attack sounds way cooler, but Whatever. <laughs> And then I have a scar right here that only shows up when it's cold and rainy. But it's right here. And that was from the car wreck I was in when I was four years old. The one that my dad was in that passed away. Fractured my skull and got 32 stitches in my face. Our scars tell a story. Our scars tell a story. Sometimes they're the reminders of our own stubbornness, of our own desire and to do things our way. That limp, I think, for Jacob, it was a reminder of his own weakness, his own limitations. It was a reminder of his dependency upon God, and I think ours is too. Paul, when you think about, he he prays, it says three times, for God to remove a thorn. We don't know what that thorn was. Maybe it was a perfect person. Maybe uh, there's all kinds of theories about what that thorn was, but the point is God didn't remove it. Instead, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, for Jacob, his limp was a constant reminder that he was dependent upon God. And for you and for me, our limps are the same. Reminders that we are dependent upon the grace and the mercy and the love of God. That we are uh, limited in what it is that we can do and that we have a, a Savior, a God who looks out for us, for many of us, our uh, limps are those reminders that we're not in control. It's embracing the mystery of God and just simply acknowledging that there's things this side of heaven that maybe we won't ever fully understand. It's a reminder that most of all, when you think about it in this way, that those limps, for Jacob, for you, for me, through all the wrestling and in the letting go, You wake up that next day limping. It's a reminder that God is close. It's a reminder that God is present in your life. 
and he's with you through all of it. And he's faithful. Yeah? Band, y'all can come out. You know, when we finally do this, I think when we finally let go and just embrace the mystery of God's presence in our lives, come to the belief that he really is with us and that we can trust him no matter what, when we allow ourselves to just trust and believe that what God says about us is actually true, that we are his children, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, that, his great, that we are saved by grace through faith, What happens when we allow ourselves to receive God's grace in our lives, to receive God's unconditional love into our lives? What happens when we realize that we already are blessed? That we already have the favor of God shining down upon our lives? That he is our provider and our sustainer and that he is faithful to see us through limps and all? You know what happens then? When we start to really understand that, you know what you feel? Gratitude. Makes you thankful. Because you got nothing left. And you're completely dependent upon him and him alone. Would you stand with me? Can we just thank God today? Oh, my words fall short. I got nothing. Jacob, Jacob's life changed when he let go. He became a different person when he decided to surrender. When he decided to just lay it all down, God reshaped his life. He reshaped his destiny. He used all the experience and all the stuff that Jacob had gone through, and he put Jacob's life on an entirely new direction. Jesus said that whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Church, I just want you to hear this morning that those of you here that you're wrestling, you've been wrestling all night, you've been wrestling all week, you've been wrestling all year, you've been wrestling with areas in your life that you don't really have any control over, but you've been trying to figure it out, you've been trying to make it happen, you've been trying to take the bull by the horns and do it yourself. I'm just here to remind you that if you will decide to let go, if you will decide to let God do whatever he wants to do in your life, if you will get to that place that you say, God, I can't do this anymore. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your love. I need your forgiveness. Your life will never be the same. Let's continue to worship, and I just challenge you for the next few minutes to press in to whatever God wants to do. I think he wants to speak a word.
prayer today. Lord, that all we have to give is ourselves. All we have to give is our very lives. Jesus, and we're so grateful that you gave your life for us. Lord, today we receive you. We receive you into our hearts and into our lives. God, we declare and we believe, Lord, that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Not because of anything we can do, but because of the price that you paid. God, covering our sins, defeating death, sin, and hell on that cross, and rising again, that we can experience new life. Father, we love you. Church, church, can we just declare that today? Can we pray? Giving, making Jesus the Lord of our lives once and for all. We say, Lord Jesus... I believe that you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Lord, I give you everything. Today I let go and I give it to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, church. Let's give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. Come on. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming out today. Would you lift your hands to heaven? We'll pray a blessing over you. We pray that everybody has a really good, safe holiday season in your travels. Father, protect everybody as they go. As people are coming to them, as we spend time with family this Thanksgiving, just to be in uh, remembrance that, of everything that you uh, have done for us. And Father, we pray you, praise you and declare this blessing over you, to, over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 